Before we leave the visual system series of this lecture series on introduction to neuroscience, I wanted to use the visual system as a way of conveying a much larger concept that's only now emerging in neuroscience. And I've really seen it talked about almost everywhere now over the last couple of years. So I just wanted to share that with you. So in the previous couple of lectures, we talked about visual processing and these very canonical circuits where we go from the primary sensory areas like the retina to some kind of thalamic areas like LG and the visual sense. And then it goes to the cortical areas like V1, goes to V2, V3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's these canonical diagrams that we draw where we see these brain areas as blocks, like these isolated islands that are parcelated. There's these brain areas and they do things like they are vision areas and auditory areas and so on and so forth. So in the visual areas, people have over the years drawn these lovely diagrams of the different visual areas and what they do. So for example, here's a kind of a really nice summary of one from 1994 by David Van Essen and Jack Gallant, where they parcelated out, uh, there's these retina, LGN layers, the very bottom, they detect things like uh, like different spots of light, right? They go to V1, that starts detecting things like uh, different oriented bars. And then we haven't talked about it yet in, these, um, in this video series, but if you go to these higher order visual areas, you'll start seeing selectivity for fancier and fancier, larger and larger scale things that are not localizing space as much and more things that are kind of more general, like face, no matter where the face is in the picture, okay? So people have drawn these pictures a lot. And using different experimental techniques, including single cell recordings um, and different types of uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, um, so they have lectures earlier on on each of those techniques, uh, exactly how they work. And if you use those techniques, you'll often see, if you look up just like how does your brain work, you'll often see a diagram like this one, where you see these very nicely delineated pieces of your brain with labels of names and also what they do. Okay, so like there's these colorful areas and a little summary of this is the part that's associated with higher order decision making. This is your frontal cortex. That's where decisions are actually being made. Now the reality, is that it's becoming very clear in the last couple of years, especially using the high throughput neural recording and imaging techniques that we're now using, that that story is at most very incomplete. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of what I mean by it's really incomplete. In this paper, um, Nick Steinmetz and colleagues decided to put a bunch of neural pixels probes into a, uh, a series of mice brains. And so if you wanna know more about these neural pixels probes, they're super duper cool. They're like basically currently the highest density probes we can put into the brain. They have thousands of sites. So instead of recording from single neurons, we can record from thousands of tens of thousands of sites at the same time and see lots and lots of simultaneous activity from lots of different brain areas, lots of different parts of the brain circuit. So there's a video on extracellular recording techniques if you want to review what those are like and why they're so awesome. So one of the things that they did here is to use these probes to look not only at single cells in V1, but lots and lots of cells in V1, and lots and lots of cells not only in visual areas, but every other brain area as well. And what they found is that even in V1, even in what we consider to be the canonical first stop in the visual processing pathway, yes, there's representation of vision, what's actually being seen, but there's actually cells there that are representing and processing processing and reflecting other things, including action, okay? So it's not like there's this strict parcellation between vision and action and decision making in the way that some of these diagrams will lead you to believe. Here's a direct evidence that even in V1, what we consider to be the pure primary sensory areas for vision, there's lots of other sensory things and even action-oriented signals that are also in that part of the brain. So it's not so simple. Here's another, uh, another piece of evidence along the same lines. Here, um, Mussel and colleagues decided to uh, do a similar experiment, but instead of doing um, high throughput neuropixels probes, they actually did that as well in this paper, but this is a wide field calcium imaging of the entire dorsal surface of a mouse cortex. Now the mouse cortex, unlike the human cortex, is actually a flat sheet, which is maybe poor for them, but really good for us because we can image all of it at the same time because it doesn't have gyrations. Um, so here what they did is kind of like a classic, uh, you know, classic experiment that we might do in a behavior experiment for a mouse where they 
they are licking uh, in response to some stimulus. And here they tested visual stimulus as well as auditory stimulus. Now the classic way of analyzing this data set is that you look for signatures, the representations of either the visual stimulus or the auditory stimulus in whatever brain area you happen to manage to have gotten a couple of probes into. Now the beautiful thing here is that instead of having to choose which brain area to monitor, using calcium imaging, they can actually do wide field imaging that monitors the entire cortical surface of the brain. So now we're not really biased to looking at single or even a few different brain areas. We can look at all of it in cortex. Furthermore, we're not biased towards cells that we can actually spike sort from. We can just see kind of bulk average activity from all of them. Now, because they're not restricted to only analyzing uh, responses in response to what they know they gave the, the mouse, they were able to track not only what the mouse got as input, they also tracked uh, lots of video features. They like, basically had a high-speed video of the mouse's face, so how it was twitching its whiskers. They tracked its hind limbs to see what it was doing with its back paws when it was supposed to be doing this vision and auditory task. And what they found, um, you, you're either surprised or not surprised, depending on what you thought about animal behavior before you read this paper. Um, I do remember reading this paper for the first time. I was like, yes, I knew it. And what they found was that the, the parts of the brain that represented the the task, the thing that we as experimenters told the mouse to do, the flashing lights, sounds, et cetera, et cetera, was actually a very small part of what the brain was actually doing. What it was largely doing is uninstructed things, like I'm, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm like playing my little mouse video game, and I'm going to scratch my hind limbs with my left paw, okay, I'm going to scratch, 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 or oh, I smelled something because somebody walked into the room, or somebody didn't clean this room the same way today as they did yesterday, and so I'm going to sniff, 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 sniff. That's more interesting than the sounds and the and the, and, the, and, the, and the flashes of light my experimenter is presenting to me. Now, I know I'm anthropomorphizing a lot, but that's sort of the interpretation here, right? Like, this brain is doing so much more than just representing receptive fields for vision and for audition in the way that we can easily control as an experimenter. So both of those pieces of information um, go towards making this overall point, and there's lots and lots of papers, especially recently, making a similar point, that the brain is not nearly as neatly parcelated as our diagrams show. You see all these diagrams. This is auditory cortex. This is parietal cortex. This is prefrontal cortex. And we can draw these lines as if they were real things. Um, it's as if we were planting tulips in the sky. It's like you know, purple tulips go over here, and pink tulips go over here, and you will not cross this line because I put you there. That is not at all how the brain works. The brain is a lot messier than that because there's a lot of feedback, because all of these brain areas actually talk to each other in ways that uh, we are just only beginning to understand. We also don't quite understand why this is happening. Why is it that the brain is not nearly as parcelated as our diagrams? What is the point of having everything be everywhere? Well, it's becoming clear that it is increasingly true that everything is everywhere, but what we don't know is quite why. Um, so I just wanted to tell you that and share a couple of uh, kind of new emerging areas. And I think this is a really interesting point to make, in part because it really showcases the way that our understanding of brains follows to some extent our development of technology. So those two new papers that I highlighted, these relatively new results coming out, that was only recently possible because of technological advances in the ways that we can measure and record and also eventually manipulate neural activity. And so this view that everything is in fact everywhere and kind of all at once, we know it now to be true in a way it is more nuanced than we knew before. What we're trying to work on now is why. Why does this happen? What is it good for? Um, I have no answers to these questions, but I'm very interested in the answers. And so hopefully this is something that a lot of people will be working on um, and will have more nuanced answers in the future.